So, as we begin 2014, we have really seen continuation of several of the themes that we saw at the end of 2013. The global economy continues to improve, although there is a significant divergence between the developed world and the developing world. The general improvement that we're seeing is not only weak, but it is also uneven in terms of its distribution. Same time, we've also seen certain political risks come to the fore during this first quarter, which act as potential threats to that ongoing improvement that we're seeing in the global recovery. Now, of course, the key driver uh, for that global recovery has really come from the US. And in the US, we have seen that the data has been very strong. Uh, we've seen the unemployment rate fall, that's now down to 6.7%. We've seen the consumer starting to spend. We've seen uh, industry producing more. And we've also seen house prices go up. All of that is very supportive of the market and suggests that the underlying economy is growing and growing quite strongly. However, we also have to be mindful of the fact that the significant monetary stimulus program that was being put in place in order to generate that recovery in the economy is now being taken away. Janet Yellen, in her first speech as chair of the Federal Reserve, made it quite clear that she would continue the slowdown of asset purchases. At the present time, that is running at $55 billion a month, and she suggested that that would continue until it is extinguished. Under pressure, she was also asked when we could expect to see the first interest rate rises taking place. And she commented that that might be somewhere in the region of six months after we see the end of that monetary stimulus program. Now, working backwards, that would suggest that we're likely to see those first interest rate increases taking place in the US sometime in the early part of 2015. And of course, as yet, we don't really know what the impact of that will be in terms of the pace of the recovery going forward for the US. The same is also true, of course, within the UK, and the data that's coming through from the UK also remains strong. In the UK, we've seen unemployment uh, fall to 7.2%. We've also seen the inflation rate fall and fall to now 1.7%, which is well below government target. At the same time, consumer spending continues to move forward. And we've also seen house prices rise by approximately 9% across the country over the course of the year. That, once again, is all very good news as far as the economy is concerned. But we have to be careful, as we've suggested before, in terms of some of the drivers of that growth. We know that some of the government policies, such as the Help to Buy scheme, have helped with that growth, and that, of course, won't necessarily be maintained. One of the key issues is the question of wage inflation. We know that wage inflation in the UK is now running at 1.4%, which is still below the headline inflation rate of 1.7%. And unless we see that wage inflation come through, we're unlikely to see the consumer spending continue and lead to that self-sustaining recovery which we need. At the same time, it's very important that companies that have built up those cash balances on their balance sheets continue and start to spend that money if that is going to lead through in terms of that growth going forward. But otherwise, the position in the UK is looking strong. Just as we have in the US, however, we have to be careful about what's going to happen with regard to interest rates. Just as the Fed has done uh, in the US, so in the UK, Mark Carney and the Bank of England have provided forward guidance to suggest when we might expect to see the first interest rate increases taking place. Like the US, that looks like it could take place in 2015, and that forward guidance has made it quite clear that those increases are likely to be very gradual, so it will only come into effect over a period of time. Of course, one of the other key impacts as far as the UK is concerned is our key trade partner in Europe and the continued difficulties with which they are faced. In Europe, there are really two key risks upon which we have to focus. The first is the fact that inflation in Europe is still running at approximately 0.5%. Overall, for the course of the year, it's expected to be less than 1%, and there is a real concern that Europe could enter a sustained period of deflation, which would be very bad for the economy. Against that, the ECB is taking what action it can to try and stimulate the economy, firstly through the cuts in interest rates that we've seen, but now potentially they could be forced into a position of undertaking direct quantitative easing. Whatever, some action needs to be taken to try and stimulate the economy to get it moving in a forward direction. The other key risk we've identified within Europe previously was around the political risk. Now there we were really talking about issues, for example, such as in Greece or in Italy. And of course, it wasn't those areas. The real concern in this particular quarter has arisen because of Russia and its annexation of the Crimea from Ukraine. That potentially creates some significant headwinds as far as the economy is concerned. Trade sanctions are likely to be put in place against Russia, which will be bad news for the Russian economy itself, and we've already seen our Russian equity markets fall. Russia really only is an exporter of energy, oil and gas, and therefore the impact upon its economy could be quite significant. But also, those particular sanctions could also affect a number of other European countries who were importers of that same energy. 
And we might see that now diverted across to Asian markets. So energy prices could increase, which would be bad, obviously, for people within Europe. At the same time, we also have the Ukraine itself, which is a major exporter of wheat, and we could see wheat prices continue to move upward, as we've seen very recently, which again could be detrimental. So that particular political situation has led to some difficulties and could lead to some further difficulties for the economy going forward. On the other side of the world, over in Japan, uh, we see the continuation of the significant monetary stimulus program that's been put in place by Prime Minister Abe. When he was elected at the start of the previous year, he put in place three arrows of reform. The first of those was the monetary stimulus program, the second was some fiscal changes which he, he wished to make, and then finally some structural reforms. The first two of those are now underway. The impact of the structural reform is very difficult to gauge and we'll have to see how that pays out over a period of time. But for the moment, the measures which have put in place have certainly helped to stimulate the economy within Japan and have added to that improvement across all of the developing world. On the other hand, part of the impact of that has been negative as far as developing markets are concerned. And the real concern within developing markets has been the continued slowdown of China. Chinese growth has been uh, reduced over a period of time and is currently trading around 7.5% per annum. But as it's come down, that, we've also seen the level of default starting to increase across the number of companies within China. Now, the People's Bank of China have made it quite clear that they will not allow any particular default to destabilize financial markets. But we've seen those starting to come through, and one in particular for Haishin Steel could be significant because it's a major industry within China and therefore markets are watching very closely to see how those defaults escalate over a period of time. The People's Bank of China have made it clear that they will provide the support that's needed and the government have also made it clear that their target remains to maintain that GDP growth at 7.5%. So although things are looking difficult, they still look like they have things under control. In a wider context for emerging markets, uh, the continued concerns remain the fact that Chinese growth is slowing and that therefore has tended to reduce commodity prices, which has an impact on many of those smaller uh, economies around the world. At the same time, the removal of the monetary stimulus program has also pushed up the cost of borrowing, and therefore many of those developing economies have been caught in this dual problem over the recent period. If we now turn our attention to markets and what's been happening there, well, during this course of the first quarter, actually equity markets have been really quite stable. They've been volatile during the period, but the overall return has been pretty much flat. We've seen minor levels of growth from the US and also from Europe, but otherwise, broadly speaking, it has been flat right across the quarter. With the exception of Japan. Japan saw a relatively significant decline over the uh, course of this quarter, but in truth, of course, that's picking up for what was a very significant level of growth during the course of Q4. Otherwise, and broadly speaking, equity markets have been flat over this first quarter. If we now turn our attention to bond markets, bond markets, on the other hand, have actually increased slightly in value after what was a very poor year for them during the course of 2013. In truth, that's really a reaction to the fact that equity markets had stalled briefly during this period, and we've seen the yield on bonds obviously increase quite significantly over the course of 2013. It's just dipped down again very slightly during the course of this first quarter as those concerns have come back to the fore, but we expect that position to reverse and that trend of upward movement to continue going forward. Certainly, corporate bonds have continued to outperform gilts over the period, which is what we would have expected, um, but the upturn which we've seen across bond markets as a whole was perhaps more than we would have envisaged over this particular quarter. Meanwhile, property, which of course we have suggested represented a very good alternative uh, to bond markets, has once again done very well indeed over the course of the quarter. Growth on property markets was about 10% during the course of 2013 and has continued at a very strong pace in this first quarter. Once again, investors continue to look for the very strong yield which is available from the rental income as opposed to the lower levels of yield which are currently available from bond markets. Now looking at markets going forward, what do we expect? Well, we continue to favour equities over bonds because we fundamentally feel that equity markets are likely to continue to increase from here as we see the global economy continuing to improve. At the same time, as we look towards interest rate increases, we're likely to see bond values start to fall. As we had suggested, really growth in equity markets is really going to be much more muted, however, during the course of 2014 by comparison to the previous year. Many expected that the growth we'd seen in 2013 would continue, but we felt unless we had the justification for those increases in valuations, driven by improvements in the underlying economy, would not see anything like the same overall levels of return. And certainly that has been the experience in this first quarter, even allowing for the political uncertainty which has taken place. From here, we do expect to see markets continue to move forward and to move forward at that modest pace. 
Bond markets, on the other hand, are likely to continue to see yields drift up and therefore capital values drift down as we move closer to the time when interest rates are likely to start to rise. One of the other key factors within bond markets that we have seen is the fact that the spread, the differential between corporate bond yields and government gilt yields, has actually come down to about 1%, which we might regard as the new long-term norm for those rates. What that would suggest is the outperformance of corporate bonds over gilts has now perhaps come to an end, and we might now expect to see both corporate bonds and gilts move in the same direction in a very similar way. Certainly, within the bond market, we would very much favour absolute return bond strategies rather than simply investing in conventional bond assets such as corporate bonds or gilts. And we would also favour the property market still. As we've discussed, the property market has done very well during the course of 2013. We expect that to continue forward in 2014 before it starts to revert to its long-term norm of delivering a return of around 7%. But for now, the attraction of yield looks very strong and we expect to see capital flows still move from bond investors across into property market, which is likely to push those valuations up. So ex expect to see the property market continue to do well for some short time yet. Overall, 2014 has really started off in many ways as we would have anticipated. Some of the significant growth we'd seen at the end of 2013 was perhaps overdone. And we're now in a situation where, looking forward, things are going to be much more gradual than they had been previously. We still believe that equities will continue to move forward. We still feel that bond markets are going to be under some pressure. But underlying that, we feel that the recovery in the global economy is still very much on track. And we can expect that to come through and start to provide the sustained support for markets, which it really requires. Certainly, with the exception of unusual items, such as the situation in Crimea, we expect the markets to be relatively stable from here, and we're quite optimistic about the investment outlook.